Or glue, and then there was People another. Love that type of stuff. Yeah, they love drama. Oh my god, they love drama, especially and the Muslim community. Yeah, yeah. they follow for the drama <laughs> and then stay for the law. Right, yeah. that's how you reel them in. Yeah, exactly. It's the immigrant unfiltered podcast with Hamza Ali. Hey guys, welcome back to the podcast. I'm your host Hamza Ali, and we're here with Hasib today from Illinois. Well, he's actually from Miami, but we're gonna get into that in just a second. Uh, go, great to have you. Thank you for coming. I know it was a, it's a day trip for you. <laughs> it's great to be here, yeah. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. So tell us a little bit about yourself, man. Who is Hasib? Obviously, you have social media. You know, you've, got, you've gained quite a lot of traction. I have a bunch of questions that I really want to dig deep into and kind of get because I think you did a couple of cool things that people should know about. Uh, but tell us a little bit about yourself. So yeah, my name is Hasib. Uh, grew up in Miami. I'm 30 years old. Just turned 30 this year. Um, yeah, I've, I'm a lawyer in Chicago, uh, and, you know, found my way onto TikTok and sort of made that my, my full-time thing, uh, left corporate mid-sized law firm life to just do my own thing as a, as, a, as an entrepreneur. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. Congrats. So obviously, the first thing I'm going to go into is what everybody wants to talk about, and that is your love, and blind, love is blind uh, appearance. Oh, that thing. Yes. So, <laughs> uh, you know, let's get into that. How does, the, how does something like that happen? How did you decide? What was the pushback like, if any? You, I mean, earlier we were speaking, you said you grew up pretty uh, conservative, sort of, even though you well, grew up in, in Miami. The community's pretty conservative, so when someone does something like that, people are always like, why is he on a reality TV show? Uh, but I've always been the type of person in my community to go against the grain and not really do what everyone else was. Um, I've just been known to do some crazy stuff. Like I, that's just, that was just me growing up. I would do whatever, you know, people told me not to. I would get myself into a lot of trouble. Uh, I still get myself into a lot of trouble saying stuff that I probably shouldn't be saying. Uh, but you know, it, it was it was strange how how it all worked out. I would. I wouldn't do it again, maybe not a dating show again. I'd probably do a show again. Um, but the way I found myself in that, I mean, I didn't apply for it or anything. It's just this reality TV Netflix show that um, people go into these pods and then you're supposed to talk to someone on the other side and with the goal of getting married. Let's be real. I don't I didn't really expect myself to get anywhere on that show, which um, I guess people now know, like, I don't know how serious I was in approaching it, but my mindset was more like, let's see what happens. How often can someone, how often does that happen for anybody? Like, what are the odds that anyone will ever get to go on something like this again? So that was kind of always in the back of my mind. So I was on this dating app and um, I matched with this person who I started talking to them a little bit. Um, they weren't Desi, Muslim, Brown, or anything like that. I was just talking to them, and then they're like, "Oh, you're great. Let's let's just get on a phone call." And I thought I was just talking to like you know a potential partner, who knows? Um, and I had a great conversation with this person. I was like, "Oh my God, you're like you're amazing. Um, like let's let's hang out or something." And then um, we we spoke on the phone a couple more times, and then I uh, kind of got catfished because all of a sudden she's like. Oh, by the way, I'm not here to like date. I'm actually a casting producer for this show. I think you'd be great for it. I'm like, oh, what's the show? She's like, oh, Love is Blind. I never heard of it. Uh, and then I looked at what it was on Netflix and all of a sudden I'm like, oh, this looks cool. Um, screw it, let's do it. Let's, let's, let me talk to the casting director. And then from there it was just history. They loved me. So that's um, how they recruited you? Yeah. I got, what was the name of the app? Uh, it was Hinge. Hinge, okay. It was Hinge, okay, yeah. guys, get on Hinge. Get on Hinge if you want to get on TV, <laughs> but if you want to get married, I don't know. <laughs> There's a bunch of those apps, too. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and then uh, the way the, the rest of it unfolded was uh, with, there was a lot of, like, interviews and stuff. And this was, like, right around when COVID was starting. They kept telling us, um, yeah, COVID's going to delay things, so we're waiting on when we're going to go out to California and do this show. Um, and then it got pushed back a little bit more. Uh, and then I just found myself on it, like it recorded around April 2021 or something like that. Uh, they took us into these, a studio in California and uh, rolling the cameras. They, they had like men on one side, women on the other. We're not allowed to see them. Uh, we were staying back at a hotel room. 
They would take us every day to studio. We would record all day long just talking to people. Honestly, the experience was crazy because when can you ever just detach from everything going on in your life? And at the time, I had a job that I was just working for somebody, a law firm. I didn't really care that much. Like, I could take time away. And that uh, in the back of my mind, I'm like, I'm not missing out on work because I don't really care about work. Still kind of don't care as much about work <laughs> as I should. But, um, but yeah, I just did it. And um, I... You know, I wasn't expecting to get married on this show, but I just wanted to see what it was all about. So what is that experience? Like you said, guys on one side, girls on one side. So you really don't like know what is going on? No, yeah, it's pretty, uh, you know, it's pretty, uh, pretty strict. Like you, even if you wanted to use the bathroom, you would have to get escorted so that you don't accidentally run into someone you might, might see on the other side. Uh, they just put us in these rooms and you get to talk to everybody. I had some great conversations with some of the people on the other side. My intention obviously wasn't like, you know, anything serious, uh, but I was willing to see what would happen. Uh, yeah, and nothing did. Any friends? Uh, I came out with the, actually, I still keep in touch with a lot of the people from it. Um, a lot of people live much different lives now than they did when I met them on there. Uh, can't go to a local Chicago restaurant without someone asking uh, them for pictures. And then they're like, oh, yeah, you know, he was on the show, too. Uh, that happens for me here and there now. And I go to, like, Muslim places because, I guess, um, like, at Isna, people are like, you got that show? I'm like, no, that wasn't me. <laughs> I joke around with them. But, uh, but they, uh, they eventually pull it up on their Instagram. Uh, I never wanted to be known as that brown guy on that TV show that one time that was on there for two seconds. They gave me more screen time than I thought they would because, you know, they kind of feed everyone out, whoever doesn't, like, propose or anything. And I know, I think they really wanted me to just because they liked my background, they liked my story, um, but I wasn't going to do it just because... What do you mean they wanted you to? I think they, I think they, the way, the way they, the way producers are, are they're always in your ear. And uh, for them, I think they really wanted to see an interracial, inter, like, uh, opposite, like, very different religions, very different backgrounds coming together. Um, I think they liked my personality a lot. So they, they, really, they really encouraged uh, me to explore and go, go in with an open mind. Uh, it just wasn't, I wasn't listening to anybody. I was going to do anything. Like, imagine if I went on the show and then I went and told my mom, look, like, I got married on the show. Imagine what she'd <laughs> but say. But do you have to? I don't, from what I know, you don't have to get married. You don't. You, Even if you say that you're going yeah, to. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, but engage and then having them meet your family and all that. My mom would have been like, what the hell are you doing? Uh, I, I, and, then, and then I told her, like, mom, you know, the people that actually did get married on the show, like, they're all really, like, famous now in Chicago. And they get free stuff all the time. She's like, why didn't you get married? <laughs> <laughs> and now I get that question a lot. Generally, why aren't you married? Yeah, you're 30. Yeah, I'm 30. Uh, you know, now's the time to do it. But, uh, I, you know, the tax benefit would be nice is, like, what my yeah. eyes are on right now. Well, it depends on her income yeah. <laughs> and her situation. Yeah, my, my accountant <laughs> told me to, like, get married. <laughs> I got married when I was 24. 24. Actually, now that I think about it, I was 23 when I got married. I had my first kid when I was 24. So I had Yusuf when I was 25, and then Nora when I was 26 or 27. So my kids are, like, almost as tall as I am now. It's crazy. <laughs> I, 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 I think I was taller than my dad by middle school. Yeah. But my dad had me I think me that's going to happen. Yeah. Like we're going to be one of those parents, you know, where, like, we're walking, and then our kids are just behind us, like, you know. Yeah. How tall is your dad? My dad's like 5'9". My yeah. mom's 5'6". I don't know how I'm 6 foot 3 yeah. something. I think Yusuf's heading the same way. Yeah. You'll probably meet him for dinner. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I would love to. <laughs> so, okay. So you're saying these other people get recognized. And, you know, the producers and the directors are always in your ear because they wanted you to get married. Obviously, you went in with the intention not to get married. But there is other drama that, you know, happens on the show. Is that all real stuff? It's uh, probably mostly like uh, producers get to see like what people are talking about and they sort of set up scenarios. Um, one thing that happened that I recall is that there was like some, some drama going on where this girl liked this guy, but he was engaged to another girl in the show. So the producer's like, oh, we have a brilliant idea. Let's set up this um, beach party and they'll get to talk to each other, and that's what they did. They invited me to that, so you get to see me again for you know, a brief second. 
uh, and then and then at the party they're like, okay, you guys sit here, you guys need to talk to each other. I'm like, okay, that looks kind of manufactured. <laughs> but they don't really tell you what to say, but they kind of set up scenarios, right. um, as I think is the case with all reality sure. TV. So that was kind of my fear as well in getting engaged on this show is, you know, if I was gonna do it, I would want to actually like be in love with the girl before I did it. And I know that it would have went south had producers gotten involved and, you know, had their had their mouths and had their whispers. Ears. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and then and then the edit you end up getting, I didn't want the whole world hating me. Um, yeah. But then on TikTok, uh, you get you get hate comments all the time. <laughs> Is that the case? Well, you know, TikTok's never like we. It, it's totally split. But nowadays, I think I get recognized in Chicago specifically more on TikTok. They're like, you're that guy from TikTok now, which is I like that. I like that way more than you're not. You're that guy from that reality TV show. How did it go? Um, yeah. So to TikTok, uh, you you get a whole load of people hiding behind a keyboard saying a bunch of crap that, you know. Kind of, kind of irks you sometimes. At the same time, you know, you, you, I, I think I've grown to tone, tune it out. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But don't you think like the show actually helped you grow on TikTok? I think it did. Uh, it definitely. Did. So I think right before, actually right before it aired, I had around two hundred and fifty thousand followers. Uh, and then I made a TikTok about the show. I wasn't saying anything about the show until I saw, okay, what what about me is on here. Uh, and then when I saw that I was there just enough for me to comfortably say that, okay, I can talk about the show because one, I'm on it and you could, you could tell that I was on it. And two, I'm not mad at the edit I got, which was, I had a funny yeah. line here and there and people remember that. So I, I, I gave a lot of uh, behind the scenes stuff, talked about the show. Um, you talked they, about your experience on there too. Very briefly, yeah. yeah. And uh, people are like, oh my God, I loved you, you loved your parts. Um, and then that helped my following grow another 150,000. Uh, yeah, it, it helped a lot. Yeah. yeah. So how did you start TikTok? What was world like before TikTok for you? Uh, I was just working off. Yeah, I think I had been like a lawyer for two years or yeah, it's been like three years I've been on TikTok, wow. Wow, that's just hitting me. Like I've been on TikTok for three years, and I was only a lawyer two years out, um, just working at a, a at a mid-sized law firm uh, until someone. And I wasn't taking TikTok seriously before I got on it. It was just this COVID thing that everyone was doing. I'm like, okay, the kids are on it, um, and then someone convinced me to download it and just make a tutorial because I was explaining to them what I do as a lawyer. Uh, it's like this very niche law. It's called the Fair Credit Reporting Act, like credit reporting lawsuits that I file. Uh, they told me to tell people about how that works. And then I made it first, first before I did that, I, I just wanted to see what TikTok was all about. So I was like posting these like thirst trap TikToks. It's like what the kids were doing um, and no one was watching that. And then I posted the tutorial. Uh, of how to check your credit reports to see if you could sue a credit bureau. Um, made the video, posted it, narrated behind it. It was very low production quality, uh, quick output. And then I posted it, went to sleep, woke up. That video had like 150,000 views and then 10,000 followers overnight. Um, and people love to find out how they can make a little bit of money. People are in America are litigious. Yeah. So they want, they, they followed immediately, uh, wondering when the next video is gonna drop, telling them how they can make more money with with litigation or lawsuits or what rights do they know, do they not know that they need to know? Um, what about the law can help them to their benefit? And that's why people just started clicking the follow button right away. And before I knew it, I was like at 300,000 followers. Damn. I actually don't know what that is. So what is this credit bureau? Oh, so, I, so I need to sue a couple. <laughs> <laughs> my, my, uh, my legal journey started off. I, I, I started when I when I took the Florida bar right after law school, passed it. And then I was like, you know, it felt weird because I went to Atlanta for law school, moved back to Florida. I'm like, dude, I'm back home with my parents. Bro, you say that so easily. I know people who are trying to pass the bar oh, and have well, attempted like four times. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> it, 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 yeah, I know. It, it, it wasn't it wasn't the easiest thing in the world, but um, I studied for it, passed it, got it got it done, you know, it was just another hurdle, but what, my, my struggle wasn't even the bar, it was just moving back home with my parents, I thought I was really going somewhere in my life, and I finished law school by 24, um, and I, I was like, dude, 
like I'm back home. All my friends are still in school. They're still in college. Like they're in their sixth, seventh year. Uh, we're still going to the same hookah bar every night. We're still, you know, talking to the same girls, talking about the same girls, doing the same stuff we've been doing. I need something different. And I was like, I need to just pull the trigger and take the first job that I can get out of the state. Even though this is the only state I passed the bar in, I need to just figure it out. Um, I applied to this job in Chicago uh, and it wasn't even the job that was appealing. It was the fact that they were, they were headquartered out of London um, and they were gonna send me there for a few weeks, like three or four weeks, just to train and then get, and then they'll relocate me to Chicago um, it's just like legal AI company. I take that job just to get to London, just because I was low key. I was just depressed. I was like, I, I don't really like my life right now. When I was 24, uh, nothing was really going my way. I get to London. Um, I'm in training every day till noon and uh, they're paying for everything. They put me up a nice hotel in Covent Garden. Um, all my meals are expensed. I was there for a month. I rack up like an expense sheet of like $30,000. I submitted to them, they paid it happily. They relocate me to Chicago, end up hating the job. And then I find this lawyer that's like, oh, you're Florida license. I'm like, yeah, I'm eventually gonna take Illinois. I don't know when. Um, and he's, uh, he's like, why don't you come work with me? I actually uh, have a way for you to practice law in Illinois, even without the license. I know you're Florida license. Yeah. So I got admitted into a federal district court, the Northern District of Illinois, which lets you do that with the license of any state. And then I just found myself doing criminal defense. Never in a million years I thought I'd be defending criminals. Um, and I, I worked for a solo practitioner, left the job that paid be thirty thousand dollars basically to go to London, and uh, within a month of working there, just are you still I, doing that? No, this is when uh, this was when <laughs> I first moved to Chicago. Uh, I don't think they like me too much now, but I don't care. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, and then I then I found myself uh, working for this criminal defense attorney. Uh, the way he got cases was he's court appointed, so all the overflow work that the federal defender's office can't. Um, can't take on or whether they're conflicted out of because they can only have one federal defender on a case. They send two local attorneys all over Chicago. So he's on a panel of attorneys. They pay out at like 150 bucks an hour. So I wasn't making crazy money. I was making like 50 bucks an hour because he was giving me part of what he was billing at. Um, but it was work from home, which was like a game changer for me. Like, I'm okay, now I can work on my time. I have the time to explore other things. I have the time to, you know, time to myself. I'll work when I want. I don't really have to answer to many people except that one guy who was great to me, who's now just a friend and actually works with me as opposed to me working for well, him. Yeah. Uh, but I, I got so much criminal defense experience that now I made myself um, available on that list, the list that he was on. Now I get criminal court appointed cases too. What's that like? It's it's scary just because like my name's out there, my address is out there. I'm on cases where I'm representing gang members stuff like that and in, getting, in illinois in a, yeah out yeah. of all places exactly in chicago in chicago mm -hmm. town murder capital <laughs> so, yeah. and so what is what are like scary scenarios there um so we had like a murder rico case where um i actually got someone who was accused of murder off on on charges um just because of a technicality um, but, you know, dealing with their family members, dealing with them, it's not always the most pleasant experience because we do get a lot of angry clients. So I've, um, I'm still on the federal defenders list, um, just figuring out whether I want to stay on it, uh, given that now I've kind of pivoted into doing some of the civil work that I do now, where I, uh, I found a niche of suing cons credit bureaus like yeah. Experian, TransUnion, mm -hmm. Equifax. Um, it's a very like specialized law. It's very interesting. If like your credit reports don't add up, like if there, if the like let's say Experian says you died, but you're alive, right? You go around applying for a mortgage and you can't get it, uh, and they're saying it's because you dead, you're dead, and then you tell Experian, hey, I'm not dead, and they don't remove that indicator off your report. You have grounds to sue. It's stuff like that. And that's I, I found out about that law when um, I was kind of done with the criminal stuff for the most part, uh, or done working for the guy I was working for just because he didn't have much work for me left. I found a, uh, a defense firm to work for where we were, we were actually defending who was getting sued under consumer laws. And I'm like, all the plaintiff lawyers are making the money. Uh, I'm just sitting here billing out hours getting my crappy salary. Like, 
there's only so much that 100,000 a year is going to get me. Uh, so I went plaintiff side just to learn the business. And then um, this year, as a, and then I kind of like moonlighted on the side, um, building my own book of business, building my own referral sources, getting on TikTok, making a brand for myself. As of January of this year, I'm completely solo. I uh, left the firm I was working for where it's kind of interesting because now everyone I've pretty much worked for as a lawyer, now I work alongside because now they send me cases as, as a solo attorney. Now I'm on referrals with a bunch of my old connections, which is great. I have never burned a bridge like that. So um, yeah, I, I'm happy to keep the relationship going where now I can work for myself, but at the same time, keep that relationship with everyone I've ever worked with. Bro, you're working so hard. Yeah, you you would be so many moves uh, <laughs> in, at such you know so little time. Yeah, I, 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 my mind's always running at full speed. I'm always thinking about all right, what's the next thing that I, I can do just to further my own brand. There's always something, um, you know, whatever brings business through the door. My thing isn't like I want to get on the best possible things. I'm always thinking. Like all press is good press. Now I've transitioned my TikTok into getting onto documentaries, doing commentary for like Tubi. Now I make videos with Complex and BuzzFeed. Uh, HuffPost has me as a as just a creator making videos for whatever there's something going on in the legal world or anything I even want to just talk about as a as a South Asian, as a Muslim, as a as a as a child of the diaspora, like anything I want to talk about, they just commission me to do it and pay me for it, which is great. But then people are like, okay, let me just search him up and then find what I actually do. Or if I'm talking about law, it's like, okay, he seems to know what he's talking about. Let me hire him for that. Um, so I've built out this referral process where if I if I get a case, I, I'm able I'm easily able to send it out to a firm that can handle it. But they hire me because because they think I know what I'm talking about. Right. I hope I do. And uh, look, I, I think from a legal standpoint, a lot of this business is a referral business. Like yeah. A lot of stuff goes out. And I mean, if you're a solopreneur, are you a solopreneur? I'm or? solo. I don't want I don't have any assistant, nothing like that. I, I'm looking for an attorney right now because I want to step away from doing most of the legal work. And I want to just dish it off to someone who's better suited yeah. to do it. I just want to be the rainmaker, bring in business. I'm, I'm happy doing it. Well, I mean, that's where the money's at. Yeah, exactly. Well, who like, wants right? to do the work? I don't want to, yeah. <laughs> I want to draft discovery responses. I want to, you know, bring on the client and let someone else do the heavy right. lifting. For sure. And so how how does that even, like, you're on all these platforms, right? How does that financially benefit you? Or how much does that financially benefit you? Um, so it, it started it started off on TikTok. And I never thought I'd, like, just be a TikToker full time. Uh, but my, my goal has always been on TikTok, uh, talking about laws, because I think at the end of the day, um, people find me and they want to hire me. So it's bringing in business. It's building a rapport. People know that I know what I'm talking about. If I pulled up TikTok right now and just look at the inbox, I, would, I can show you probably in the last hour, 10 people who reached out to me trying to hire me, telling me about some problem. This happens all day long. 24-7, all day long, I, I probably get 100 messages. And how many of those convert? Like, maybe, maybe one. Maybe one a day. Maybe one a week. It's usually trash. Or usually something that I don't really want to take on. Um, just because I don't have the bandwidth. And most of the people want an attorney to sue for, like, $1,000. I'm right. like, I'm not, you know, it costs $1,000 to file a lawsuit, right? right? right, right. <laughs> and people don't really, really realize that that's, you don't need an attorney for that. Um, my, but my whole thing on TikTok has always been, how can I bring in business? I don't want to do the, you know. Have the, you brought in business from TikTok? Tons. How that, much? Uh, to the point where I was able to leave my how job. How much business? So actually, the biggest thing that I brought in through TikTok hasn't been the actual business, but bringing in referral sources, they found like credit. My, my biggest referral sources have been like people in the credit world, people, mortgage lenders, and they find me on TikTok talking about credit consumer laws, and they see that okay, he he seems to know what he's talking about. Let me reach out to him. They reach out to me, and they found me because I'm just talking about credit on TikTok. I'm just an authority. Right. And um, that so was. Are you talking hundreds of thousands of dollars? Uh, oh, well, you're talking money. I'm talking money. How much has TikTok uh, brought? Like because of TikTok so, directly? So because, of directly? because of TikTok, yes, hundreds of thousands. Of dollars? Of dollars. Just in... Just, ju just ju being on TikTok creating? Not that, the that creator fund, but like... Not zero, yeah. yeah. No, no sponsorships, no creator fund. 
Just business that's it, coming business in. Business that of comes in. Oh, I, I don't. I'm it. not on Google Ads. I'm not. I don't have billboards. I'm not on TV. This is just from TikTok. And, and can why, you scale that? I, I'm trying to. Why would I? Why would I continue to work for anybody at a hundred thousand dollars a year when? Just business from TikTok, alhamdulillah. This could change at any moment. My TikTok could get banned tomorrow. I've been trying to milk it for what it's worth as long as I possibly can, which is what I'm doing right now. But um, yeah, TikTok has made me, I, I'm not on anything else. This is my soul. Yeah. So you're just using it to drive business and it's working, obviously. Yeah. You're making hundreds of thousands of dollars yes. and you can make more. Yes. Because, you know, we had another attorney who came on and she was part of a law firm in California and she said that she makes more money on TikTok than she does being a lawyer. And everybody in her law firm doesn't understand why she's still an attorney. She probably makes it through sponsorships yeah, or sponsorships something. So, th so that's not really the case that. for me. Yeah. There are companies that try to sponsor me and stuff, say make a video. I'm like, my time's just better spent doing what I do and bringing in referral sources and even people who want to hire me. Um, I'll, let me give you an example. Someone hired me. I made a, uh, there's this law in Illinois called BIPA. It's a Biometric Information Privacy Act. What it says is if you work at a, uh, at anywhere uh, and you scan your fingerprint to clock into work, clock out of work, this is an Illinois law, and they don't get your informed consent on you putting your fingerprint in their system and you're doing that, you could be entitled up to $1,000 for every time you scan your fingerprint. 10 times a week. Yeah. Hundred, hundreds, of, and that's what the law says. Um, so I just made a video about it. I didn't know, I didn't know how to file lawsuits on this type of law. Um, someone found me, they said they work at this place and I'm like, okay, screw it. I'm gonna, I'm just gonna retain you, file a law, a class action lawsuit against, um, the, the, your employer immediately. Uh, after I filed that lawsuit within a month, uh, attorney reaches out. He's like, what do you want? Um, I'm like, no, I, I want to settle the class. I don't want to settle my individual client. I want to settle every, every employee who's ever worked for you. I want them to get money. They're like, okay, what's that going to take? We got to a number, uh, and everybody within that class got Something. a portion of the settlement. And then I get 30%, 40% of that, of like hundreds of thousands settlement. of dollars. Right. Just by filing a lawsuit. Now let me, what's to stop me from doing this three, four, five, six times a year, six times a month. Yeah. And that's how that's. You just have to find it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Everything's out there. I can figure out how to do anything on the plaintiff side because all the complaints are public record. Nothing's stopping me from copying and pasting and just changing the plaintiff's name, filing the lawsuit, settling that case. And so, okay. So you, you have the credit stuff where you go after the bureaus, mm -hmm. bureaus have money, so they're gonna settle. Yeah, yeah, pretty right? much, pretty much. They're like insurance. They, they have like unlimited money. Right. They have so much money. And so they're, they're gonna settle. And then you have the class action stuff that you're doing, and then you have TikTok. Uh, what else? So so t TikTok doesn't, I, I, I'm on the creator fund and all that, but like what's what, what do you make on the creator fund? Like, on four can, or 500,000 followers? I just pulled it up the other day and I just actually signed up for it. I, didn't, I don't care about the TikTok beta? money. Huh? The beta? I don't know what it is, but I just saw that the balance is like 200 bucks or something like that. Okay. And I don't, I don't look for that money. I'm not like making videos for that number to go up. I don't right. care about it. It's I irrelevant. care about getting in front of eyes. I care about building a report, people believing me, and people like wanting to hire me. That's yeah. all I care about. Yeah. So funny, funny thing you say this is because when TikTok first came out, I got on TikTok, I started dancing, just like everybody else. I yeah. was literally dancing. I just sold my company. I didn't report to anyone. I didn't have any investors. I didn't care. So I was like, okay, I'm kind of <laughs> retired. I'm just going to dance on TikTok. Danced on TikTok for a bit. Then I was like, hold on, wait a minute. Let me talk about real estate. Talked about real estate, built up a following, and then you know, kept talking about real estate to the point where today, I think 95% of my business is driven through social media, 95. Wow. I, if, so if someone comes to me outside of social media, and that could be either paid, like ads, because I put a bunch of ads, or organic, I ask them, do you follow me on social media? And if they say no, I actually reject them. I say, okay, go follow me for like a few months and then come back and then maybe we can do business. Because you yeah. really need to understand how we operate, you know, as, as a brand. And people are like, okay, yeah, fine, we'll do that. So I have to reject a bunch of people because they don't know who I am. Yeah. And it's just so much more easier because they come in, sign paperwork, in either invest or educate, whatever it is, uh, but they need to know what they're doing, you know, exactly. and who they're dealing with. 
exactly. And is it so? I'm, it's the same for you. Yeah. Well, you're probably at 95. I'm probably at 100 percent. Besides, like my court-appointed criminal law stuff that I just get sent, which I'm dwindling down. Um, yeah, it's pretty much all of it is through social media. And I, if they say, "Hey, can you tell me about this law?" or "I want to learn more about it," I don't. I don't type anything out anymore. I just point them to a video. I'm just like, watch this video and you'll you'll see what... You'll get it. Exactly. It saves so much time. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I think the nicest thing about TikTok has been not only just the fact that I'm able to do all this and bring in business, uh, you know, I, and I make it maybe made it sound like I, like the only reason I'm on there is uh, for money. And, but I also have found benefit of using the platform to spread awareness for causes that I believe in. Pakistan was flooded last year about a year ago to this day maybe i wanted i raised money with islamic relief on on tiktok um you know whenever something's going on in the community i like to talk about it um just for awareness things that i believe in things i I'm think i saw some about. of your stuff about ramadan yeah what was going on in ramadan i don't know there was some drama there's always drama on ramadan. so what is that talk about it <laughs> what's the drama um so so uh so there's like my tiktok is not just just law that's boring. Um, I think a lot of people follow me because I cover things like true crime as well, which at the end of the day, it's like tra all traffic is good traffic. They'll find if they find me for true crime, they'll, they'll watch my law stuff. Uh, I also talk about things going on in the Muslim community, Chicago, Chicago news, stuff like that. Um, there were these uh, fights that happened at Gawa House in Chicago. I think that's what I saw. Yeah. People, people saw, people saw that video, and they're like, "Are you the guy who covers those like Chicago Muslim legal dra uh, Muslim drama?" And I'm like, uh, "Yeah, I do talk about that sometimes, but I still talk about a ton of other things." Um, people still uh, now, and I, I don't think I could go to Kaaba House without without them being like, "Why are you here? <laughs> like, you're defaming our business." I'm not talking about the business. I'm talking about your patrons. I'm talking about people who like fight over chairs here. Like, why are you guys doing that? So what happened that day? Um, honestly, like saw hearsay, but uh, there there were several times that there were there a couple times that this happened. So the first time was during during Ramadan, like these kids were fighting in thobes. Uh, people were saying that it was over girls. I don't know, but I don't talk in absolutes when I when I cover this stuff. I, I use I'm very careful with what I say. You're an attorney. Yeah, I'm very careful with what I say. It's always like, oh, people are saying this is happening, allegedly happening. Uh, apparently it's over girls. Apparently they're fighting over girls. Uh, and then I got a bunch of DMs like, oh, you're, you're defaming them. They're, they're not fighting over girls. I'm like, okay, whatever they're fighting over, I don't care. The fact of the matter is they're fighting. Why are they fighting? Uh, but people were glued to stuff like that. People are glued. And then there was people another. People love that type of stuff. Yeah, they love drama. Oh, my God. They love drama. Especially and the Muslim community. Yeah, they right? follow for the yeah. drama and then stay for the law. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's how you reel them in. Yeah, exactly. Talk about... Um, you know, whatever's going, whatever's going on in the community. There's this one, uh, I, I guess people love to hear a brown voice. They love to hear a Muslim voice uh, just talking about, you know, things relating to them. I'm someone who looks like them talking about things that they might, they might be going, they might be a patron of Kawa House. So, okay, this is interesting. Oh, but he talks about, and then once they follow me, um, they see, oh, consumer law, interesting. Okay, now I know about that. Um, it's just a snowball effect. Do people reach out to you for other types of things? I'm sure they reach out to you with all types of oh, issues my, and family that's, drama that's and the other thing. drama. I want to sue my, you know, whatever. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, whatever I'm talking about at the moment. So I get into a lot of lottery stuff, too. I talk about the lottery a lot, stuck for Allah. Um, but I talk about what to do if you were to come across a jackpot or any type of windfall, whether you play the lottery gamble or not. I talk about what to do with, with whatever winnings you get um so whenever the powerball or the mega millions go past a billion i start making those videos again about what to do when you win and people eat that stuff up they love tutorials guidance anything i can offer and lottery winners reach out to us our law firm they're like what do we do we we won the lottery i'm like how much did you win they're like oh so you know some of the amounts are insignificant but we get we get quite a few people reaching out to us what does it take to be a lawyer? Um, so that's, a, that's an interesting question. It, I think anyone could be a lawyer. Anybody could be a lawyer. It's not hard. You just have to go to law school, pass the bar. 
it's that's easy. You could it's very learnable. To be a entrepreneurial lawyer, to be doing what I do, I think it takes more. I'm not a, I'm not an academic person. I my parents have like four, they wanted me to be a doctor so bad. They wanted me to like they wanted and my brother eventually became one. Hamula Salisa was one of us that did. But they wanted they wanted to just shove books down our throats, and they knew that I wasn't really the type to pick it all up. But what I always was was there's this word in Urdu called chalak. That Smart. means exactly clever. Clever. There you go. Yeah. Clever. I find my way around things pretty easily. I understand things as soon as I see them, uh, and the way my mind thinks is okay. Like why is this person? doing what they're doing and are they making money from it um so i've kind of used that to back whatever i've been doing in law to make it work for me uh so to be a solo attorney i think anyone could be an attorney but to be a solo attorney to be an entrepreneurial attorney you just have to be chalak you know the thing is is that you talk about the law law is one thing yeah operating a business is a completely different thing and that's what you're doing more than the law part, yeah. right? And social media is part of your strategy. And I think that's just playing at a, at a very different level than a lot of people who are just practicing and just being lawyers. So yeah. when I was working at the law firm, the very last law firm that what I- What was that experience like? Sorry, I had to cut you off no, there. Is it boring working for other people? Oh, to- yeah, yeah, I can't. Uh, so so the, the firm that I worked for, which I kind of do the type of law that they were doing, like the credit stuff, this is the la- very last firm I was working for. They taught me all of this. Everything I do, they, they taught. But what I did was I made them, and I, I did the math, and I saw how many cases I was settling for them. I made them over a million dollars in my first year there. How much did I see? 130 grand. I made them a million dollars. I got pennies. Yeah. I'm like, why am I doing all this for someone else when I could just do it for myself? But not everyone thinks that way. Not everyone. Everyone's just happy with their 130, with their 150. Like they'll, they'll do it with a smile on their face. They'll they'll work for the man and slave their life away. It's just not me. Um, I'm. I, I don't know whether it's a chip on my shoulder. Um, it has to be. I never grew up with money. Like my parents, my mom's first job was Dunkin' Donuts. My dad's first job was Pizza Hut. Um, got screwed over a lot of times. My dad tried businesses. Got screwed over a lot. Uh, he was always suing people. Just because he was in uh, litigation, uh, he was gonna, either landlords, business partners, stuff like that. I was always the one talking to his attorneys. It's uh, kind of where my interest spa- sprawled from. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think it's kind of always been like, I, I saw how hard my parents worked for their kids. Um, and it can't all be for nothing. So I think that's just been my driving factor. What about getting out of your environment? You think that changed you? I think so. I, I, I needed, I, when I lived in Atlanta, that was just school. I got it over with hated Atlanta. When I moved back to Florida, I was like, okay, I'm back home with my parents doing the same stuff I've always been doing. And then I think Chicago is such a crazy city because people, like you, you gotta be tough to, to make it in, in a place like Chicago in the legal world. Uh, or in the business world, you you gotta like have grit. Uh, just being surrounded by those buildings, I, I can't wait to. I go back to Chicago tomorrow, and I can't wait to get off of 90 because every time I see that skyline, I'm just like, I really want to make it in the city. When I moved there, I was like, oh, I want a high rise in that part of town. Two years ago, I got a condo in the high in the high rise I wanted. Like, and now I look down on the apartment I used to live in. It's like right below me. I'm like, this is where I started. And this is where I am. It's just because of you know, all that's around me. Yeah. It's a, it's it feeds a, you. Yeah, exactly. Are you extroverted? Um, people say I am, but I love alone time. I love, like, sakun, being alone, uh, away from the noise. I love going on walks by myself. I go to the movies alone. I do a lot of things alone. But when I am in an environment with tons of people around me, I do thrive. So people say that, okay, you're an extrovert. Well, I try to convince them, like, but I love not being around people. So, people so don't believe being it. around people, does it give you energy or does it drain energy from you? It, it, I, I feed off the room. I read the room well. Yeah. If 
There's it, and it depends on the crowd. It depends. Okay, so wait. It depends on the crowd because there's certain crowd that are not at your pace, and you could get bored quickly. Y yeah. But if you are in a crowd that's that's just as you know, or even maybe faster than you, would that would you feed off of that? I, I think you have to catch me at the right mood on top of what type of crowd I'm in. If there's like, if there, you know, because you get a different me. I'm not saying I have split personality, but I, uh, when, when, there's not really anybody exactly my age that I'm friends with. Yeah. I know Everybody's no other. Older. I, some people, okay, half my friends are older, like way older. Yeah. Half my friends are younger, much younger. There's no one else I think I'm friends with who's born in 93. There's no one exactly my age. And my older friends get a different me, and then my younger friends get a different me. So uh, I think I'm able to adjust based off of who I'm around, as opposed to thinking I have split personality, because I hope I don't. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, it's funny you say that, because I've always wondered myself, or I always used to wonder uh, that um, I'm very similar to you, the meaning like, the, you know, it would depend on the room. It would have to be the right table. Yeah. If it's the right table, I feed off of them, right? If it's the wrong table, I'm just not stimulated. So there's nothing for me to really take from those people. And then I feel like, well, I need to be with the right table. So it turns out I joined a peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, like a mentorship group, like a mastermind. And believe it or not, there's people like you and like me in there where... Oh, really? they're all just looking for the same thing. And everybody just wants to feed off of everyone and we just keep feeding and feeding and feeding and then, you know, until, like, there's no more to give. And what ends up happening is we just end up, everybody ends up <laughs> quitting in the end because <laughs> there's just too much, you know? And so I think there's a good balance and, you know, like you said, you, you enjoy Sukun. It's very good that you've uh, realized that at 30. I definitely did not know that when I was 30. <laughs> I was still, like, you know, all, all over the place. Uh, so, yeah, it's, you know, very fascinating to hear that story from you. Very, I feel like if I was a younger person and I had realized that earlier myself, I would be in a different place today. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah Sukun is the biggest thing for me, but you you just wouldn't think that seeing me in different type of environments because uh, a lot of people accuse me of being a Leo. And I'm like, what does that mean? What is What are Leos? Like, what's the trait about them? They're like, oh yeah, you know, in, in a crowd, they're the ones that seek out the most attention. I'm like, I don't want to be the, I don't want to be the clout chaser, or the attention seeker. I don't want to be that within the group. And they're like, no, it's just like the energy that you have in a room. Um, maybe they're confusing it with presence, but I do, I, I do tend to be the louder one in a group. Uh, maybe sometimes more assertive as well. I'm not always the leader but I do contribute a lot more in environments than maybe, than I should. Yeah, yeah. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's not for everyone, Yeah. but it's for someone. Yeah, I wouldn't change it. I mean, I like, I, I, I like how I maneuver across my friend groups. I think I, I think I adjust people, some people say I'm a chameleon, but I, I, I know my audience. And sometimes you just have to be that way. You yeah. know, in order to cater to everybody, uh, if you're not a chameleon, there, you know, half the world's going to hate you. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you got to know your audience. I think that's why I, that's why it works well on TikTok, because I know how to talk to the my, my Muslim audience and I know how to talk to my litigious white America. So let's talk about that for a second, because earlier you mentioned a hinge. Yeah. You're probably the first guest I've had. So obviously we talk about dating apps all the time. You're the first one to mention Hinge or you know any of the, of that side of the apps, yeah. app world. Um, and so what's your type? Um, my type is some yeah at this point like my type has changed across like my my eras. Uh, at this point, I think my type more is just someone who's compassionate, kind, and um, someone who's emotionally mature. Within the community. Uh, yeah. Um, so I, I am talking to someone right now, okay. uh, and I think that that we'll see we'll see how it goes. Uh, they're probably going to be watching this, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I someone someone within the community. Um, 
Because earlier Muslim, you mentioned Muslim is like, important. Muslim you, is important. You mentioned something that I, I, like I can't take her home to my mom, right? And yeah. So that would lead me to believe that even that you know initial hinge, whatever conversation that was, it wasn't going to go anywhere. You, so so my my mom it actually came come came around to the idea that you know at the end of the day, like if if you love a person and they're willing to you know take on the fold, it, it could work. Okay. Uh, and I think initially my mom was more hell bent on me finding the right Muslim, Muslim the right Pakistani. Um, it's not the case anymore. My mom's seen it work for others. Like they, she's seen like people who've converted and it worked for them. So um, and, you know, and my mom loves me so much. I like as every brown guy mom does. Like we get babied to death. There's nothing. There's nothing that I can do in this world to make my mom stop loving me. And there's nothing. I'm a I'm a very convincing lawyer. Okay. Uh, I'm not saying I'm great at my job, but I I I could I could convince my mom to do anything. Okay. Cause just cause she, cause I know she loves me. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, what what is it called? The mother's love is unconditional, right? Yeah. It's, I it's it could the be only with love that's un unconditional. Exactly. I could be with anyone, and my mom would love me. Yeah. So it, that's not really what I was thinking about um, when when considering who I end up with. Because I know I could sway my mom either way. Yeah, my that's dad. Good. My dad really doesn't care. That's good to hear. I remember when I was 23, uh, I just finished college. I started working when I was 17, 18. I was with Sana, my wife, uh, now. Uh, since then, so yeah. we were high school sweethearts, and then we went to the same university. But I joined her, and I was also what you call chalak. So like, I used her to like do my projects and my <laughs> stuff and all of that and uh, ended up then we ended up getting married right out of college because I was working for a few years and uh, and I remember when I first went to my mom and my dad I was like 22 or something 22 23 and I was like okay I'm ready to get married you know I want to get married here's the girl I found her and she wasn't in my culture she was a part of my community she was nothing you know and uh, and my parents just like you know I could see it they just they didn't know what was happening, what hit them. And it took me a lot of convincing. I'm also very persuasive, so it took me a lot of convincing for them. My yeah. dad was, in the beginning, my dad was like, I don't even want to meet, meet her, you know? Wow. Um, I was 22, bro, like, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so uh, he's like, no, it doesn't make sense. You know, this will go away. It's going to be gone. Don't bother me. And then I kept like, you know, I, I think that's probably what like annoyed me even more. I'm like, no, I got to do this. <laughs> you know? That's that's how I function, too. If someone tells me like I can't do something, I just want I just want it more. Right. Um, but I think at this like when I was 22, I think my mom believed that she had more of a preference over who I end up with. But at this point, she just wants me to end up with someone. Yeah. Eight years later. Eight years later. Yeah, it is. She's 30. like, I'm 30. She's like, just get married now. I don't even care. Are you ready, though? Um, I, in the next two years or so, okay. inshallah, like, we'll see see how things play out. But um, yeah, I can see myself. Yeah, because now, I mean, I mean, everybody now is getting married later. Yeah, it's the thing. It's the thing. Yeah, my dad had me 40. at 30, and I'm at 30, and I'm not married, but I'm not even in a rush. Once I hit 30, I'm just like, I'm chilling. I'm chilling. You know, I don't, like, I, I always thought at... I'd be married by like 26 or something like that. 27 was the year, but now I'm 30. I'm like, why was I thinking that way? I'm, you know, at 27, I wasn't ready. I, just, I knew like mentally, I just wasn't ready. You know what the thing is and what I feel personally is that I got married young. Yeah. Okay. I hadn't built enough time to have a preference or, or be picky yeah. or have a lifestyle uh, to like, you know, that, oh, she needs to fit this and she needs to be like that. It wasn't like that. It was yeah. like we, you know, we dated all through college and then we were like, yeah, let's just get married. And we were like, yeah, this is going to be, we don't even know like where this is going to go or what's going to yeah. happen. But I feel like as you grow older, it just becomes more and more difficult because you yourself are sort of like a block. Mm -hmm. Is that the case? For me, I think I just now at 30 learned about what I want. It took me talking to enough women to understand what I don't, what doesn't work well with me, what works well with me, and what, it's shaped my preference. A lot of, there's a lot of misfortunes and, you know, falling outs and, you know, relationships that just didn't work for me to find the one, the, 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 the type that I want to end up with. Right. Um, you know, around, around the time 
that the, that's, that I was filming the show and then that it aired, um, it was not talking to anybody during the show or anything like that. But afterwards, like right around the time that it was airing was when I was getting to know people. But immediately after, I, the amount of DMs I got of people trying to set me up with someone they know was unreal. But now I realize like I could have never done that. I could have never... I, one, I am not the type of person that wants to be set up with anyone, and I'm not the type of person that wants to, like, the, the dating apps would have never worked for me at this point now. Like, even if I was, like, complete, like, looking again, if I was, like, totally single looking, I probably wouldn't jump on a dating app. I, that's just not how I want to meet someone. It's not how, it's not, it doesn't work for me. Like, I want, I want to run into somebody, and it, and it was like, yeah, it sounds nice for everybody. Uh, that, that, that's their fantasy. I want to, you know, meet somebody at a wedding, uh, have their debutta stuck in my watch. <laughs> but, you know, you know, it sounds like a fantasy, but that's... Not the way things are done anymore. Yeah, yeah. That was my time, man. <laughs> so my time was a Middle East, no dating apps, no uh, Facebook. I think Facebook was just a thing. Maybe it, was, it just started and mm -hmm. it was in the very infancy. So the social media was not really a thing. Uh, and we met people organically. Yeah. You know? So yeah. How and that's many people how I are prefer you going to meet? Exactly. You know? Exactly. And, you know, it, it's also made it easy because the same type of guys who wouldn't approach women, um, whatever the reason may be, but it just made it so much easier for them to do it just because all you have to do is swipe right. If you match, just say something. Yeah. It's easy. Anyone yeah. could do that yeah. as opposed to saying, oh, my God, I think that girl's cute. What should I do? Go talk to her. So how did you meet your uh, uh, it was present? At, it was at a um, cooking class, oddly enough, that um, one of my friends was hosting back in Chicago. This was years ago. Um, and we had been friends for, I met her there, her and her friends, and we've been friends for a, a pretty long, pretty long time. So it takes like friendship before, um, before taking things the next step yeah. further and, you know, getting to know them at a different, um, you know, for a different reason. And did her parents know about the friendship? Yeah, um, I, I met her parents. She's met mine. It's it's going well. It's going well. Yeah, it's good to hear, man. Yeah, well, you know, we'll see Inshallah what happens. It works out. Yeah, Inshallah, pray for me. Yeah, I will, man, for sure. Yeah. I don't know if my prayers will do you any good, but I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, let's talk about DMs. Good-looking guy on a TV show, successful attorney. I'm sure you get people reaching out to you. Uh, not setting up. I'm sure you get women reaching out to you directly. What's that like? I am not allowed to open them. <laughs> I'm not allowed to. <laughs> I'm not allowed to respond to them. But you get them. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's uh, it ends up in my other folder because it's usually people I don't really like follow, or uh, yeah. It ha you know what's so funny is uh, you go to a place like Awa House and then immediately get DMs like afterwards were you at Kawa House? I could show you them they're like were you at Kawa House <laughs> that, that one night I'm like uh, you're not gonna get a response <laughs> or a, I'm not even gonna accept the message uh, I just can't but yeah it, it happens a lot it and it's so funny because it happens more after you're unavailable as opposed to it happening when you know I, you know I'm completely single I could have totally entertained this um, but it seems to just happen at the wrong time. Yeah, they do, for sure. Yeah. Uh, the reason I bring it up is that everybody who sits there on, on that chair that you're sitting, yeah. it's, it's a significant amount of DMs. Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to get into my DMs because my, my, actually, my social media account is tracked by Zara. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, my DMs are very interesting. Uh, but, yeah, it's just something I guess we're going to have to learn to live with, right? Yeah. I, there, you know, people, I'm also, like, not public about talking to anybody on my social media so it doesn't look like I just look like a single guy honestly if like you see my pictures it doesn't look like I'm in a relationship or anything um, but you know every I don't I don't really put that stuff out there either like it's just private yeah so maybe it. maybe maybe I can't blame them right like I would have maybe when I was 23 would have done the same stuff I would have been sliding in people's DMs too I don't know any aggressive DMs cuz I get I get a few that are aggressive yeah, you definitely here and there. Uh, well, you know, more on TikTok. Uh, I get I get aggressive DMs from people like 
trying to hire me and stuff. It's just no. I'm talking about love DMs. love DMs, aggressive um, love DMs. They, I, I'm not like aggressive, but I get very persistent yeah. DMs. Like people who've been messaging for such a long time, uh, and I'm like, dude, I don't know how <laughs> you have the time to like. How do you even keep up with this? Yeah. I get it. But you got to appreciate that to some point. Like, there's there's you know, some hustle in that. It too. takes a lot of persistence for some people. That's right. Yeah. You know, before we end, I wanted to go over some of the stuff that I'm going through. Obviously, you're an attorney. I'm going to take advantage of this. Um, I went, I, go, I get multiple, I used to get a lot of lawsuits, get into a lot of lawsuits as a landlord. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I grew thick skin. I won most of them. Most of them were baseless. And, you know, what I've learned is that tenants uh, will try to, get as much as they can, which sometimes they do. You know, it's not a significant amount, but sometimes they win, sometimes I win. Uh, but more recently, and something that I've been more vocal about ever since I got my green card, is I actually got scammed out of a million dollars uh, by an immigration attorney who lives here in this neighborhood. And, uh, and basically, you know when the Yemen thing happened, when the travel ban happened? Yeah. So there was a lot of tension around that time. And uh, within the Middle Eastern and Desi community, people knew that I was kind of like a, like a high roller, let's just say, because of my business and the income and that type of thing. So I, I got approached by this attorney and uh, he basically claimed that I was, there was a red flag on my name and I wouldn't be able to travel and if, I, if anything ever happened, I would get deported and my kids would be in trouble and all of this. So he played like a really deep, long game and he convinced me to give him a million dollars. To, to resolve my immigration issues and get me my green card. At that time, I didn't have my green card. So I'd just come in, I was on a work visa, and you know, that type of thing. So anyways, ended up giving him a million dollars. I'm suing him now. It, I've been, I've, the lawsuit has been going for about, I don't know, five years now. And he ends up suing me because I made a, a video about it. Defamation? A, a defamation and whatnot. But, you know, uh, so he's a pretty shady character. And if you look him up, bunch of lawsuits like people are suing him left and right he's suing people left and right like he's just very active in the world of lawsuits and so hopefully this year I get to go on trial jury uh, in front of a jury mm -hmm. and I'm really excited about that but it's just crazy you know in my mind what people can get away with here especially someone being an attorney like this guy's literally taking advantage of the situation that he's an attorney and bending everything he can just to you know either evade or you know or or just not comply and it's just made my life living hell man i can't imagine did you report million it? dollars did you, i mean that's no joke yeah. first of all he shouldn't have solicited you right. like that there's right. no, so he got a referral fee so we we subpoenaed his bank accounts yeah. the guy that took me to him got paid twenty thousand dollars was that person an attorney no that in itself is a violation of bar ethics. Right. You can't you can't give uh, you can't fee split with a non-attorney. Obviously, he's not going to say it was a commission. Exactly. But we have the bank records. What do they call it? Marketing. I don't know. Whatever. He's going to expense it. So that's going to be interesting. So that's one thing. Okay. Then what I ended up finding out is he took my million because the million dollars it was so urgent, you know. So what I did is I tried to figure out okay, why a million dollars and why was he so it was there was a need it was urgent. And so it turns out he ends up buying a piece of land with that million dollars that I believe was like some type of foreclosure or he had limited amount of time to go and buy that land. So what I did is um, that land ended up going into bankruptcy for him. So he wasn't able to make payments, um, you know, because of all the movement that he had. And as a result of that, uh, I ended up putting, I ended up filing as a person for that bankruptcy as well. Your no. creditor on the bankruptcy, exactly. so you get, exactly. you get paid. And so, priority. unfortunately, there was nothing left after the debt was paid. But the judge, Judge Morgan, did a really good job with, uh, it, w it was called a letter of fact or a letter of findings or something like that, in which he basically said that while that guy was on the bench, he was a complete liar. Like 80% of what he said was lies. And it didn't make sense. As an attorney... As is he is he still yeah, yeah. So is he still licensed? He's still licensed. Did you report okay. him to the bar? I did. Unfortunately, nothing came out of it. Nothing came out nothing of it. Nothing came out of it. The bar had the bar will investigate that. Yeah. Um, but how long ago did you report oh, it? It was a long time ago, man. Um, over two years ago, probably. 
like did maybe, he check maybe did he check years. the bar to see if he's still licensed in texas oh he's still licensed he's practicing man he's out there because like i get dms from other people that he scammed that hey could you help me like you know ever since i went vocal because the thing is i was quiet until i got my uh, green card because i didn't know what the hell this guy was gonna do right is he gonna like uh you know i don't know report me or do something or just ban thing or whatever that was but once i got my green card then i started going vocal um and you know I do the same thing according to what the judge said. I just report on that and I talk about it. I haven't really talked about it too much because I just got yeah. my green card like literally like not too long ago. Uh, but I do plan on discussing this and opening this up yeah. uh, so that other people know. You know, because immigrants, look, I, I got lucky. I, I made enough money to where I feel confident I can fight this guy and I can spend money to fight him. But there's a lot of people who don't. Yeah. They, just, yeah. they just let it go. Well, this judge literally came out and found that he perjured himself and they still still nothing came of that nothing that was in bankruptcy court so now i'm going to the actual lawsuit yeah. so this was a side case that i had yeah the original lawsuit i filed it in time um and it's still going through courts and this guy's been like delaying it and COVID happened and this happened and you know my mom died and my dad and you know all he, these did he did he try to set i mean don't, you don't have to talk about it but he tried to settle with you say all right just no. take this he, he may claim that he tried to settle with me but he did not is he pro se? Is he is he representing himself in the no, no, defense? No, no. He has no, a firm. Yeah, yeah, he has a firm. Wow. Yeah. You gotta slip me his name because I gotta look into this. I yeah. got. I mean, that's that. It's crazy. I, there are million the, dollars. The way the bar, the way the bar investigates, I don't understand some of the some of the reasoning behind the their rationale as to like disciplining some attorneys but not really disciplining right. others. Right. There's an attorney in Chicago that literally gets in bar fights all the time. But what the, but the one thing you can't do is commingle client funds or like take money from a client. But that's the literally the worst thing that an attorney can do, right. and that bar will not hold back from disciplining an attorney and making an example. Out. So right. the fact that you said you reported this and the bar did nothing about it. So it could be because I maybe drafted the documents or maybe I didn't do a good job explaining what exactly happened. Uh, maybe. I don't know, but yeah, it's uh, it's definitely something that till today I have to work with, you know. And still today, this lawsuit is still pending, and we're we're trying to get it done, and we're trying to really take this guy down. Legally. I would just keep filing bar complaints. I would. But can you do that even yeah, after I would, there's no statute of limitation? Uh, so bar complaints are just with the. It's not even something that you're filing against him. It's right. really you telling the bar like this needs to be looked into because he stole money from me. Right. That's ridiculous. Yeah. That, that that just doesn't fly. It was crazy. It was That's the one thing you can't do. You could literally, Bro, as an attorney, assault 20, people. 2017, or whenever the travel ban, whenever Trump came yeah. into power and the travel ban came in, bro, we were f fearful of our lives at that point yeah. because of this guy. You know? I mean, of course, the situation was very difficult, and we didn't know what was going to happen because we were hearing all these people are going back, and, you know, these people with their visas, they're not renewing anymore. They have to leave. And I had a business. I had investors. Yeah. My and my business was, like, significant, you know? It wasn't, like... So, as a result of that, I was very fearful as to what is going to happen if, if, like, what is going to happen to my investors, to my limited partners, to all of this, if something were to happen to me. And so, this guy swooped in at the right time and just played on that. Did you talk to any other attorneys around? I did not at the time. And the reason I didn't talk to anyone is because I wasn't, like, I was in panic. Yeah. And as soon as this person came to me, I was like, please just find me a solution. You know what I mean? Um... And then I came to find out that it was all just a, a scam. A scam. I I'm in disbelief how yeah, that I'll talk did, to you about that it over didn't dinner. get Yeah, 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 that's ridiculous. Yeah, it's scary, man. Yeah. So, but you know, since then, he lost his office, so he doesn't have an office anymore. He has like a remote office, shitty office, like somewhere, like you know, it's not even remote. I think his office is out of his house or something. Uh, he lost his land. So that went into bankruptcy. He couldn't make payments. Uh, he lost everything, or so he, so it seems, right? Uh, but he still drives a super fancy car, s you know, still out and about. So you said he still practices, but did and you actually type his name into yeah, 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 yeah. it? It says active? He's active, yeah. That's crazy. It's, yeah, it's crazy. And I remember the first video I made about it on TikTok, which was recent, 
I actually got people who reached out to me. They're like, bro. This happened to me too. This happened to me With some too. other yeah. attorney, not yeah. this guy. Oh, you know? yeah, yeah. oh my gosh, attorney. yeah, it's a mess. Um, and so I was like, what the hell's going on, man? Like, you know, there's, there's people who are in this just to take advantage of other people. And that's my situation, of course, now. I'm just sharing it with you. It's, and so I'm sharing you, it with the, you know. With the you sued him uh, for? For a million dollars. Malpract- was it malpractice or Mal- theft? Well, it was malpractice and it was a bunch of other things. I don't know okay. exactly. I, I'm, like if I give you, yeah, okay. yeah. If I give you the names, you'll be you'll be able to look up the lawsuits. Yeah, uh, and it was just uh, you know, it's just a. I, I honestly I can't wait to get in front of a jury because this guy is just like I don't understand how he's still like you know doing what he's doing. So, step one is, is the jury trial. You get the verdict. You get a judgment, and the collecting on the judgment is just yeah. a whole other. So monster. that, but you know what? At least if I have, the, the collection then I take it to the next level. Yeah. You know, the money, I can wait. Yeah, that's not important <laughs> to you. It's just the principle at that <laughs> exactly. point. And a lot of my clients say the same thing. Right. You know what? I don't even care about that. Right. I want to pay you right. before I want to pay that person. Right. Like, it's not and about so, that. And so that's kind of what we're, what we're working towards. Now, the good thing is that in the bankruptcy court, technically, what was that thing that I got? Finding a fact? Is that what it's called? Yeah. So... Bankruptcy judges do make findings of fact. That's what it's stuff. called, right? Yeah. So I got a finding of fact in my favor. Yeah. And then he appealed it. So there's four things he appealed it on. There's two of those things he lost. Mm-hmm. So he's going to continue. He's probably going to take it up, you know. Uh, but he keeps losing now, which is good. And I think one of them, if he loses them, then I don't even have to pursue the other lawsuit. I can just go on. go. Basically, the law on this then automatically yeah. goes into that. Are you paying your lawyers hourly? I am. It's expensive. Yeah. I So these days, I don't really take on hourly work. Yeah. Just because uh, a lot of clients fight on bills. And is say, it contingency-based then? Huh? All of what I do is yeah. all fee-shifting, right? So under, under the FCRA, the Fair Credit Reporting Act, the law that I sue on, uh, my client is entitled to their statutory damages and attorney's fees. So that's how we get paid. Right. Client doesn't, yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, no, I'm paying for sure. That's expensive. Oh, it's expensive. Yeah. It's by the time it's all said and done, I don't even know if it's worth the uh, The judgment will hopefully cure that and get you compensated there too. Yeah. But so, yeah. you know, we're waiting. Uh we'll see. But you know, the exciting thing is that it's all gonna hopefully get resolved this year. This year was Inshallah. a big year for me. You know, so I got my uh red, white and blue. And now I'm moving towards uh, hopefully this vic- this is the only thing so far that I feel personally that I have not won in yet. Yeah. And I like winning. <laughs> you and me both, brother. <laughs> yeah. So, so that, well. that, that's my, uh, you know, legal uh, uh, issues here in the U.S. Other than that, like I said, man, look, when, you, when, you're, when you're in real estate, you're going to get sued. Yeah. It's, it's the cost stuff. of doing business. It, it's, yeah, it's just here and there, and it's fine. It's part of life, you know. Yeah. Man, that's a – I'm just in disbelief how a million dollars and still didn't get looked at twice. Yeah. Keep filing those bar complaints. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Yeah. Maybe I'll keep doing that. I don't know. My attorneys are not. Uh, my attorneys are more hopeful on the bankruptcy court uh, stuff, and if that goes through, uh, then hopefully that cures everything. Yeah, I've already moved on. Like you know. So uh, yeah, those are sta- statements that he's made in front of a tribunal, like a bankruptcy court, will can be used against oh, him. Oh, they in, will. In, oh, bro, in jury you should court, yeah. you should listen to you. Yeah. If I give you the transcripts, bro, this guy's a joke. I don't even understand how he's an attorney. That's, to be honest. That's it. And um, and so it's going to be very interesting to see him in uh, front of a jury because the jury's going to say the same thing. Yeah. That could have totally been me. I could have yeah. put up that money. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So he hit with punitive damages on top. Of, hopefully, it'll come out to be a lot more than hopefully. a million. Hopefully. Yeah. So I'm I'm very hopeful and I'm very ex- I'm very actually honestly happy that it's getting done this year. Yeah. So you know uh, we're gonna end on that. That was a that was a high note I think. <laughs> uh, once again, Hasib, thank you for coming, man. Thanks I really for appreciate me. time. Um, I know you're very busy and there's a lot of things that happen. But you know what? Out of this, not only came a great podcast, but it's gonna be an amazing friendship. I can't wait for it. That's awesome, man. Habibis, if you guys enjoyed this podcast, make sure to like, subscribe, and share this with your loved ones. Look, if you have family, if you have someone that you think this would resonate with, make sure to hear about it. Also, if you have any comments, any feedback, make sure to email me on the email below in the description of the podcast, wherever you're hearing this, Spotify, Apple Music, YouTube, and all the other platforms that we're on. I look forward to hearing from all of you.